Good morning and welcome to our MS&F online Sunday service of praise, prayer and scripture for Sunday the 30th of August. I have come up to Drumtochty Forest this morning in the glen that runs up from Orkham Blay towards the Cairn Mount on an overcast but at least dry day to record this piece. Last week the Kirk Session met, online of course, to discuss a couple of important matters. These were, how can we at least start going about a limited reopening of our church building in Ferryden and the upgrading of our building in South Montrose, the Phyllis Hub, our outreach and community centre. These two buildings represent different facets of our Christian life, our desire to worship and praise God and our call to mission and discipleship. So this morning we look at these two aspects with the help of the scripture. But first... And so to church family celebrations. Happy birthday to Alan Duncan who celebrated his birthday early, earlier in the week. I hope you had a great day Alan. And a big, big happy birthday to Di Miller's uncle Charles, Jan Newton's father. Jan is one of our more distant worshippers, shall we say. She joins us from way down south, which is great. But a big happy birthday to Charles. He's 108 today. Happy birthday, Charles. Have a good day. So, as our thoughts turn back to worship, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. We still our hearts, we still our minds, and we focus on you. We don't ignore the things that trouble us. We don't simply just lay them to one side. We bring them in our hands and we lay them at your feet. Knowing that you are bigger and mightier than any of our problems. And Lord, we come in worship. Pouring the oil of love out, of our love out before you. For you are worthy. You're high and mighty, you're lifted up. You're enthroned in glory and splendour. You are Lord God Almighty and if nothing else, that alone would be enough to earn our worship. But you're so much more, Lord. You did not stay aloof in heaven. You became involved in our lives. You came in Jesus to walk amongst us, to teach us, to heal, to show us the way. And on the cross you died and from the tomb you rose again to be the way. And you send your Holy Spirit among us to continue to prompt us and to show us the way into your heart of love. So it's with thankfulness that we come before you with hearts full of praise. And yes, in your presence we're all too aware of our, our shortcomings. The things we do that we shouldn't do, the things we say that are best left unsaid, and the things left unsaid that would best be said. Those thoughts that plague us. So we confess our sins, knowing that you're true to your word and you forgive us our sins.
Lord, as we confess, you promised to wipe the slate clean, so help us receive your forgiveness and help us, Lord, to walk in your path. As we gather in our homes this morning, scattered but gathered in worship, come amongst us, Lord. Come with power and might. Come with love and grace. Come as the blowing waves, uh, blowing winds and the rushing waves. Come as the gentleness of a dove. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. So let us pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, his family, the church. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. We turn to sung worship now. And worship is a choice, whether that is the worship of prayer, of adoration, and, or whether it's the worship of song, where we lift our hearts in praise, or whether it's simply the worship of being still in the presence of the Lord. Worship is a choice. Yes, it's a choice in the sense of we choose to go to church to join with the fellowship of believers. We choose to join together uh, our, around our TV sets, our computers, our telephones, to watch this YouTube video of worship, our service, our online worship. We choose to watch more than a few seconds. We choose to watch the whole of, of, of the service and join in. It's a choice in that sense, but it's more than that, it's a choice of our hearts, whatever circumstance of life we are in, it's a choice to step from that circumstance and worship our God, the living God, the Lord God Almighty. Our first song, Blessed Be Your Name, is, is a song that represents that choice, that bridge you give and take away. It was written out of a deep personal loss of the songwriters. And yet, in their distress, in their grief, they wrote, Still I will say, Blessed be your name. So let's sing together, Blessed be your name, in the land that is plentiful. <laughs> Thank you. 
150, verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are looking at two different pieces of scripture this morning and we have just heard Psalm 150, a psalm that delights in ways to praise God using musical instruments. An inspiration for any praise band surely and also for those who like to dance in praise of God. Although apart from young children I haven't seen that, seen much of that in churches over the years. But as humans we do like to celebrate. It is hardwired into us, most of us, at least. When I was a teenager and in my early 20s, mostly living in England, I went to a number of weddings of family and friends, and mostly they were late morning or early afternoon. They comprised the wedding ceremony itself at the church, followed by a reception, which was the meal, and the speeches after which everyone chatted a bit and went home. And then, in my mid-twenties, I moved up to Scotland, met Anne and started accompanying her to her friends' weddings. And that was when I discovered the Cayley and what fun they are, the rejoicing after a happy event. I've allowed myself to stray into talking about weddings because Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding where people were having fun in their traditional ways, including having their wee few drams, wine, of course, in their case. Although God has given a few of us what it takes to be a soloist or even a virtuoso, whether it be singing, playing an instrument or at dancing, most of us are happier when we are in a group, in a choir, a chorus, a band or orchestra, or perhaps best of all, in the congregation or audience, joining in singing or dancing, but in relative anonymity. But however we like to celebrate, at a church service, a celebration, celebrating our relationship with our Creator, Father God, or at a family celebration, or at a concert, or at a sporting picture, it is best when we do it in company, with family and friends. One of the great joys of going to the General Assembly, or even to a ministry candidates gathering, is the exuberance of the singing that you get from a group of passionate and committed Christians, singing praise to our Lord. Even though we are normally reserved Presbyterians, it is right that we should praise God. So why not do so as loudly and even as publicly as we can. God made us what we are. He made us to enjoy singing and dancing and playing music and he made us gregarious, wanting to be with others, to enjoy fellowship and so we should honour God by doing these things when we can. And that is why this pandemic has so, been so difficult for so many of us. We have not been able to do the things that God has made us for. We used to have a friend who was still managing to get to church at the grand age of about 104 and she had been properly educated. I could always rely on Mary to answer the first question of the Catechism. What is the chief end of man? I suspect many of our younger members and maybe even some of the younger ministry candidates have never even come across the Catechism, which was prepared in the mid-17th century. And I don't claim to know much of it off by heart myself. 
But the answer to the first question, as I'm sure you all know, is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify and enjoy God. And isn't that what we have become so fond of doing on a Sunday morning up until this COVID-19 virus came along and stopped us in our tracks? And many of us are wondering when we can get to do that as we used to, singing along, sometimes at the top of our voices, in church and in company. And certainly not until some time of the start of phase four of our country's response to the virus will we get to do that. In the meantime, we can still enjoy God, both at services online and on, in television in our homes on a Sunday morning, as many millions of others are doing, when we go outside and experience the full benefit of God's creation, including all these bugs that keep biting me. Amen. There are two readings from Matthew's Gospel. The first reading comes from Matthew 25 verses 34 to 40 and the second reading from Matthew 28 verses 16 to 20. So first of all the reading from Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, 
whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And then the second reading in Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Our first reading was one of the Psalms originally written many centuries before Jesus came to us as a man, before Jesus' ministry. And no doubt, Jesus and his disciples were familiar with the Psalms, the songs of worship, praise, lament, and so on. We have now come to a couple of excerpts from Matthew's Gospel, to an implied instruction on how to behave, and an explicit instruction on what to do with our lives. Without in any way trying to diminish the importance of worship, let's examine the instructions and advice that Jesus gave to his disciples and through them to us and see where that leads us. The passage from Matthew 25, once we have got over worrying about whether it is better to be a sheep or a goat, is one of my favourite passages from the Bible as it is the direct word from Jesus as to how he expects us to live. Jesus expects to, or at least hopes that, we will feed the hungry, refresh the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, nurse the sick, and visit the prisoners. Simple, isn't it? Do that lot unerringly and we will be granted God's inheritance. But that's not all. There are other things. The Great Commission. In the closing paragraph of Matthew, Jesus tells us, again through the disciples and their example, to go and make disciples of all nations baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then again, there are the two great commandments also reported in Matthew's Gospel. The first and the greatest, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second commandment, love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus, of course, went on to illustrate who our neighbour is with the parable of the Good Samaritan. So if we are to love our neighbour, then we are to act as that Samaritan did, to ignore all the social and religious taboos and to look after someone, anyone, everyone who is less fortunate than ourselves. It is easy to argue that we follow these two great commandments, then the list in Matthew 25 looks after itself. And that is true, except it's a lot easier to do the arguing than it is to carry them out. Tom Wright in one of his guides to Matthew, points out that what God is after is justice. Justice between nations, justice between individuals. And two stories related by William Barclay illustrate the intent of the verses from Matthew 25. Francis of Assisi, wealthy and high-born, was out riding one day 
and met a man disfigured by leprosy. Francis was moved to dismount and hug the poor man. As he did so, the face of the leper changed into the face of Christ. And secondly, Martin of Tours was a Roman soldier and a Christian. One freezing day, a beggar asked him for alms. Martin had no money, but seeing the man blue with cold, he ripped his shoulders cloak in half and gave one part to the beggar. That night, he had a dream. He saw Jesus in the courts of heaven, wearing half his cloak. He heard an angel ask, Master, why are you wearing that battered old cloak? Who gave it to you? And Jesus replied, My servant Martin gave it to me. We work towards creating or improving God's kingdom. As it says in the Lord's Prayer, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Is God testing us? Is he keeping a scorecard, totting up our good deeds and using them to cancel out some of our not-so-enlightened ones? I hope not, because if so, we are all doomed. We are not going to continually succeed. One of the tenets of the Reformed Church was expressed by Calvin. We are justified by grace alone, God's grace for us, God's children that God's love. God wants us to succeed. And as we so often forgive our children who we love, so God forgives us. But we shouldn't think of that as a get out of jail free card that we can use time and time again. As I just mentioned, every time we say, your will be done on earth, as in heaven, we are asking for that justice, for God's justice. And that justice means for the hungry to be fed, the thirsty to be refreshed, the stranger to be welcomed, the naked to be clothed, the sick to be nursed, and the prisoners to be visited. We ask for that universal justice in our prayers. But our prayers have got different aspects. We can pray about situations that we cannot fix. When I was working full time, we often used the phrase, we're not trying to fix world hunger. And we used it at the time to help us focus on the problems that we were trying to address, to get at least one thing done properly rather than trying to fix all the problems at the same time, one step at a time, perhaps you might say. But that doesn't mean that we should not be trying to play our part in fixing world hunger or whatever the problem we're worried about is. Another aspect of prayer, a very important aspect, maybe the most important and the most underrated aspect of prayer is listening, discerning what God has to say to us. And it would be so much easier if God sent us a text or an email, this is what you should be thinking. But instead of that, God gave us brains and an imagination and indeed self-awareness so that we can fit what is my part in bringing God's kingdom to earth into the whole what needs to be done? What in each situation that we pray for is my role? And it's too easy to pretend that I don't have a part to play in the things that we pray about. We often pray for peace, for example. We had another friend who we met at Orkinblay Church, now no longer with us, who became an adult during the Second World War. A Cockney girl she was, Jessie. She worked at the Tate and Lyle Sugar Works on the Thames in East London until it was destroyed in the Blitz. 
after the war there was a proliferation of nuclear weapons and I found out that Jesse had been one of the Greenham Common protesters living outside the fence of the airbase where the nuclear weapons were in a tent. She lived there for several years. Praying for peace had, for her, turned into action for peace. And I remember hearing Stephen Fry saying that he couldn't believe in a God that allowed children to become blind. And my immediate reaction was, well, you're a wealthy man. What part are you playing in fixing the problem? Are you at least donating to the research into this particular illness? Maybe too often we pray to God for things to be fixed, but fail to hear God telling us how to play our part in fixing them, adding our voice to the messages to politicians and to big business, withholding our support for those that we see doing wrong, and indeed donating to causes when we are not able to offer physical help. But where help is needed, near at home, then grasping the opportunity, welcoming the opportunity to follow God's commands, to pull up our shirt sleeves and offer practical help, as we hope to be able to restart at the Phyllis Hub as soon as we are allowed. One final thought. We long to worship God in our churches, but we long to, to do so for our own sakes. And there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, it is right to do so. But Jesus never asked us to worship him. He told us to make disciples. He told us to do the work of justice. He told us to love our neighbours. And all of these things we can continue doing, even though this time we cannot go to our church buildings. There is tension between our human need to praise and worship our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ, and being a disciple of Jesus out in the wider world. We do not need to get into the buildings that we have built for his glory to be an active disciple of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. Yes, Lord, there are many things that we thank you for. As the psalmist writes, not least for sending your only son Jesus to earth to die on the cross for us. But there are many people in situations where it is difficult to be thankful and we pray for them. We pray for those in this country and in other parts of the world who are still affected by the coronavirus in any way. Those who are ill, we pray for healing. For the healthcare workers, we pray for strength and resilience as they continue to care for those who are sick. We think of those whose livelihoods have been affected, for those who have lost their jobs, or those whose businesses are struggling. So many people whose lives have been changed by this pandemic. For those known to us, we now name them silently. We thank you, Lord, that we are free to worship you openly and pray for those who cannot do this who are persecuted for their faith and are left as the last in line when COVID-19 food and aid is given out. We thank you for their amazing faith in staying faithful to you, Lord, and pray that they will continue to stay strong as we also pray for those in power in these countries to come to know you, Lord God. There's been much in the news recently about refugees who risk their lives trying to get across the Channel to England. These are people who have left their own countries due to war, natural disasters or persecution. We do pray for safety for these desperate people and pray against those who are trying to make profit from the situation. There are other disasters still going on around the world which have gone out of the news. We think of the war in Yemen 
where there is a continued threat of a humanitarian crisis, meaning that the health and safety of lots of people is under threat. We do pray for peace for that country. There is also the aftermath of the explosion in Beirut, and we pray for all the people affected by that in any way. Back to our own country, we pray for the government, both at Holyrood and Westminster, for wise decisions to be made as to the way forward. We think especially of schools and pray for the safety of children, teachers and all who are involved in any way. We ask Lord for guidance for churches as we start to think about opening our buildings and as we look to the way forward. Finally, we pray for ourselves and our families that, that we'll know your presence with us throughout the coming week. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
So now, as we end our time of worship and return to thinking about the world outside our homes, go forth telling others of the good news of Christ Jesus. Show his love by your example. Feed the hungry. Refresh the thirsty. Welcome the stranger, even if you're not allowed to hug him. Clothe the naked. Nurse the sick. And visit the prisoners, those trapped in their own homes. And let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now, this day, and for evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.